The first reading for the third Sunday of Advent is from Isaiah chapter 35, beginning with the first verse. The wilderness and the dry land shall be glad. The desert shall rejoice and blossom. Like the crocus, it shall blossom abundantly and rejoice with joy and singing. The glory of Lebanon shall be given to it, the majesty of Carmel and Sharon. They shall see the glory of the Lord, the majesty of our God. Strengthen the weak hands and make firm the feeble knees. Say to those who are of a fearful heart, be strong, do not fear. Here is your God. He will come with vengeance, with terrible recompense. He will come and save you. Then the eyes of the blind shall be open and the ears of the deaf unstopped. Then the lame shall leap like a deer and the tongue of the speechless sing for joy. For water shall break forth in the wilderness and streams in the desert. The burning sand shall become a pool and the thirsty ground springs of water. The haunt of jackals shall become a swamp. The grass shall become reeds and rushes. A highway shall be there, and it shall be called the Holy Way. The unclean shall not travel on it, but it shall be for God's people. No traveler, not even fools, shall go astray. No lion shall be there, nor any ravenous, nor shall any ravenous beast come up on it. They shall not be found there, but the redeemed shall walk there. And the ransomed of the Lord shall return and come to Zion singing with singing. Everlasting joy shall be upon their heads. They shall obtain joy and gladness and sorrow and sighing shall flee away. Word of God, word of life. The second reading is from James chapter 5, beginning with the seventh verse. Be patient, therefore, beloved, until the coming of the Lord. The farmer waits for the precious crop from the earth, being patient with it until it receives the early and the late rains. You also must be patient. Strengthen your hearts, for the coming of the Lord is near. Beloved, do not grumble against one another so that you may not be judged. See, the judge is standing at the doors. As an example of suffering and patience, beloved, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. Word of God, word of life. Holy Gospel according to Saint Matthew, the eleventh chapter. When John heard in prison what the Messiah was doing, he sent word by his disciples and said to him, Are you the one who is to come, or are we to wait for another? Jesus answered them, Go and tell John what you hear and see. The blind receive their sight, the lame walk. The lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the poor have good news brought to them. And blessed is anyone who takes no offense at me. As they went away, Jesus began to speak to the crowds about John. What did you go out in the wilderness to look at? A reed shaken by the wind? What then did you go out to see? Someone dressed in soft robes? Look, those who wear soft robes are in royal palaces. But then did you, what then did you go out to see? A prophet? Yes, I tell you, and more than a prophet. This is the one about whom it is written. See, I am sending my messenger ahead of you, who will prepare your way before you. Truly, I tell you, among those born of women, no one has arisen greater than John the Baptist. Yet the least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. This is the gospel of the Lord. Be seated, please. Periodically, we find ourselves on collision courses with others. 
I heard the story of an 80-year-old woman who was arrested for shoplifting, and the judge asked of her, what did you steal? A can of peaches, she answered, and asked why she would do such a thing. She replied, I was hungry. The judge then asked her how many peaches were in the can. Six, she replied. And so the judge answered, then I will give you six days in jail. But before the judge could actually pronounce judgment, the woman's husband stood up and asked if he could say something. What is it? The judge asked. The husband replied, she also stole a can of peas. <laughs> they went straight to marriage counseling right after that. Advent likewise bursts into our lives on a collision course with human presumption. John's question of Jesus is really strangely familiar to us, echoing life's daily collisions of our expectations and our assumptions. Are you the one who is to come, or are we to wait for another? If you know anything about me, I love sci-fi movies, and I could list a lot of sci-fi movies that I enjoy, but two that really stand out that have a lot in common are the movie Dune and The Matrix, and I never get tired of watching those shows. But each of them focuses, if you've seen this, on an individual destined to become the one who will deliver their people from oppression and usher in a new age. It's a very common messianic theme in movies. But in each case, there is a grand collision of forces to determine who is going to prevail. I remember uh, an incident back in college after my sophomore year at Concordia College in Moorhead, Minnesota, which was about seven hours north, or as I th used to think of it, seven hours away from my parents. You know what that's like. Anyway, I had some distance there, a buffer. So they didn't come up every weekend to see me, nor did I, did I go home every weekend to see them. But I invited them up uh, at the end of my sophomore year to meet my then current girlfriend. And I recall my mother, we sat down at lunch, we hadn't been together more than 30 minutes, and she pulls me aside and says in earnest, Mark, is she the one? <laughs> Turns out she wasn't. And that's okay. That's okay. Moms want to know. But as I think about it, we impose that question on all sorts of things. We have our endless searches for the right college, the right job, the right spouse, the right church, the right house, the right elected officials. On and on our list goes, looking for the one at the time that will somehow meet our expectations and fulfill our hopes and dreams. John the Baptist struggled to understand who Jesus was and what he was up to. Now we may think that's kind of strange given that relationship they had when Jesus was baptized, how clearly he saw Jesus as the one to come. But a lot has happened since then. We find John shoved away in some very dark, lonely prison. He had criticized Herod Antipas for divorcing his first wife in order to marry the wife of his half-brother. And so Herod responded then by having John arrested and imprisoned. And so here today we find John full of doubt and foreboding. The Messiah he expected in his cousin Jesus had not really acted according to John's vision of God's coming reign. Confused and anxious, we hear how John sends his disciples to ask Jesus, are you really the Messiah for whom we wait? You who have turned out to be so meek and nonviolent and patient and forgiving. The significance of Jesus' reply here is not that he points to himself and says, well, John, just look at all that I have done, but rather he is always pointing to God and says, John, look what God is doing through me. The prophet Isaiah had prophesied what God would do, what the coming of God's kingdom would look like. And here Jesus embodies it so clearly. 
The blind will receive their sight, Isaiah says. The lame shall walk, the lepers cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead raised, and the poor have good news brought to them. Jesus knew that verse. All he had to do was say it. And it was clear that this is what he was doing on God's behalf. Everything that Jesus does points to God the Father and to the presence of God in our lives. In essence, Jesus says, you see what's happening, don't you, John? Do you think that God is at work here in my ministry? Do you believe these signs just might be the fulfillment of God's ancient promises? If you do, John, then I am your man. I am the one for whom you have waited. It all comes down to the collision of kingdoms, our kingdom and God's. If you think about it, the kingdom of Herod and the Romans is quite familiar to us because it is a kingdom of personal power based most of the time on fear and violence. We see that all the time. And in the end, we also know it is a defeated kingdom because it exists outside the boundaries of love which shall always prevail. The other kingdom is one of servanthood based as Jesus demonstrates on caring for the needs of others sustained always by the power of God's grace. And so this is the kingdom that Jesus proclaimed and lived by a kingdom always of promise and of hope. When our wars going on around us constantly rage and collide, where do we find our comfort? Well, like John the Baptist, we come here today to proclaim that we need something we cannot obtain on our own. We need to hear the assurance of Jesus, and we hear it here in worship. We often find ourselves, like everyone else in our culture, tempted to expend our energies in situations that are conflicting and draining. And so often they have very little to do with God's reign and much more to do with personal, economic, and political agendas that provide neither transformation nor new life. Ultimately, those agendas always lead us nowhere. A story is told of St. Francis wandering through the forest with the wolves and the birds that were his friends. And he was walking through the Umbrian forest one day and he lost his way and he was getting hungry and so emerging into a grove he saw a little house in the distance. And as he got closer he looked in the window and he saw a sign that said, fresh bread baked here daily. Oh, perfect, he thought. And so he knocked on the cottage door and was greeted by a very kind woman. And he asked, ma'am, would you please give me some of your fresh baked bread? The woman just smiled and answered, oh, we don't make the bread here. We only make the signs. <laughs> Jesus not only tells us our need of bread, he is the bread of life, freely offering himself to all who hunger. When Jesus was crucified, almost everyone thought that he was a fool. And yet the scandal and the foolishness of the cross have always remained triumphant over the fleeting powers of this age. There is just one question for us today. Is Jesus the one for whom you are looking this Advent season? Or, like so many, are your hopes and dreams found elsewhere? The choice must be made by each of us in our hearts. We look at the way of Jesus, and we look at the way of the world. Which is the one for you? Let us pray. Lord, we ask your blessings today 
as we worship you, as we proclaim you the one. The challenge, Lord, is to keep that in front of us every hour of every day because constantly we are fed false promises, false truths, false accusations, false statements about what is real and what is urgent. Lord, help us to distinguish clearly today that there is only one in our lives, and that is you, as you point to us to the Father. May that light of the one burn bright in our lives in these dark days of Advent, the late fall, the emergence of winter. May your light burn bright not only in our minds but in our hearts. And when we are tempted to turn away from the light, from the one, bring us rushing back to you. We ask it in your name. Amen.